M S W Media. Hi, I'm Harry Littman, host of Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of Fed's favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond, plus sidebars explaining important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. Hey everyone, this is Andrew Torres from the Opening Arguments Podcast. And this is AG from Muller She Wrote and the Daily Beans. And welcome to the brand new, (laughs) brand spanking new premiere of the Clean Up on Aisle 45 podcast. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, uh, I am so excited to be doing this with you, AG. Uh, It's finally a dream come true. Um, and, And I'm excited that all of you out there who are listening... As you know, from all of our many Q&As and promos, we are going to be covering the Biden Justice Department, the Biden administration more generally in terms of how do we go about rebuilding in an era post-Trump, um, probably the central figure <laughs> for at least the next year or so is going to be uh, our next attorney general, Merrick Garland. Um, I was... Uh, it, 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 AG, you and I actually talked about Merrick Garland as a potential nominee. And, you know, and my initial, uh, I I don't want to say pessimistic thoughts, but, um, you know, I was sort of looking for a young fire in the belly go getter, right? Somebody who's as pissed off as you and I and really wants to, you know, bring everybody who's ever touched Donald Trump to justice. Um, I I think we got a little bit of that from mm-hmm. <laughs> from from his introductory press conference. What do you mm-hmm. think? Yeah, I I concur. I was at first a little worried, but when he gave his remarks, and not worried, uh, but just kind of disappointed. I was looking for more of a Sally Yates type. Uh, attorney general. But but when he gave his remarks after he was introduced by Joe Biden as the next attorney general, when he introduced uh, the you know, the top four folks in his uh, Justice Department team, uh, I was very um, optimistic about what I heard Merrick Garland say about applying the rule of law. Uh, he mentioned the events of January 6th, uh, the insurrection uh, on our Capitol. He, he talked about um, how justice has to be applied equally. And, and I, I just was very <laughs> encouraged uh, by his remarks. And uh, But it, it is up to us, we the people, to hold this administration accountable, to hold the past administration accountable. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. And, you know, we've been talking about on our separate shows uh, up until this point so often about people losing faith in the Department of Justice, uh, in, in yeah. its independence, in its ability uh, to do justice. And we could spend hours talking about the failures of, of Attorney General Bill Barr, Jeff Sessions, Matthew Whitaker, any any number of uh, attorneys general and acting attorneys general that, that Trump has had in, in his tenure as president. Uh, and so I'm 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 hopeful uh, for the future. And what's interesting is we got to talk to, uh, I got to speak to, a little bit to Joyce Vance, who has written extensively on this subject uh, about uh, American people losing faith in the institution of the Department of Justice because it stopped doing justice. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, why don't we cut over to that interview? Yeah, let's listen to it. Joining us today uh, to discuss the future of the Department of Justice and what we need to do 
to to tackle how we move forward is former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance. Joyce, hi, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today because I know you have written extensively and you and I have spoken extensively about people and and the public having lost faith or losing faith in our institutions, specifically the Department of Justice. And, you know, we were always worried about people not having faith that the Department of Justice was doing justice. What are the dangers of that? And how are we going to be able to come back from that? Well, like you and I have discussed, our institutions only work as long as people trust them, as long as they have faith in them. So that's not to pretend that our institutions were perfectly functional uh, before Trump became president. They weren't. People had a lot of distrust for institutions. In the criminal justice context, uh, the specter of racial injustice has never been far away from the legitimacy of those institutions. They were already stress tested. They had a lot of work to do. And then along came Trump. And and I think we've discussed extensively for the last four years in real time the way he's damaged those institutions. So the challenge now for DOJ and really for the criminal justice system is can it meet these dual um, compromises to its public legitimacy? Can it simultaneously restore the faith that Trump sucked out of the system while addressing the racial injustice that pervades the system and that demands a fix if we're going to have any aspiration to having a fair and just system. So let me give you my short answer. I'm optimistic. I actually have started thinking about the fact that we face so many challenges that have pushed the system really towards the brink with so much public attention on it as a real opportunity. And I'm excited to see what the Biden Justice Department will do, because with so many challenges that have to be dealt with it, this won't be a time where you can just kick the can down the road and hope it fixes itself. Yeah, exactly. I don't see uh, this Justice Department being able to kick the can down the road. So it's going to be interesting to, to see what happens. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on the nomination of Merrick Garland as attorney general. So I think nominating Merrick Garland uh, signals a a commitment to institutionalism. This is someone who's been in the Justice Department before, been in the DAG's office before, understands what it's like inside of the building. And look, we all know, right, inside of an organization, there are different institutional equities that have to be balanced. And, you know, if if you're in a soft drink company, maybe it's different brands of soft drinks. But if you're inside of the Justice Department, it's maybe balancing the equities in the civil division against those in the criminal division and making sure that your work reflects all of those different equities. So, Under Trump, the Justice Department's equity was supporting the president, right? Bill Barr made very little uh, uh, charade out of the fact that he was the president's lawyer. Now, uh, if confirmed, and I feel certain that he will be, uh, Judge Garland will have to reset those equities, but will also have to make sure that DOJ, in some sense, aggressively markets itself to the public as an institution that can be trusted, not in an inappropriate way, not um, revelatory of cases that are in progress, but I think DOJ will be called upon to be more transparent about its processes than it's ever before been. And and how do you practically speaking, go about setting those equities, just practically on a practical level? Yeah, on a practical level, at least in prosecutions, it's really done in a case by case sort of way. Um, And, you know, Ferguson is such a good example, because in Ferguson, it was so clear that things had happened that were wrong, and people wanted to engage in the criminal prosecution. And ultimately, evaluation of the evidence demonstrated that DOJ didn't have cases that it could bring where it had available proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So a decision was made not to indict the criminal cases, but also um, to use processes inside of the Civil Rights Division to hold the police department accountable and to fix, so to speak, the police department through the consent decree process. So that's an example of balancing equities. Well, you know, I'm I'm really looking forward to to seeing what this Justice Department does. I think we're all looking forward to uh, kind of a, a turn back to, you know, I don't want to say normalcy, but normalcy, and and you know, kind of repairing our institutions and and moving forward from here. So I think it's going to be imperative that you know we we follow these norms and that we work 
within the confines of the Justice Department to to bring equity and justice. I think it's just going to be so important that we follow these things. Look, there's nothing that's that's more important than this. I mean, with with this administration, we've experienced the death of truth and the death of the law. But hopefully they're they're not quite dead. They're on life support and we can bring them back if we don't. I don't know what else underlies our our democracy. I don't know what else our foundational principles are if they're not truth and the rule of law. They're only mostly dead. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, thank you so much for talking to us today, Joyce. I really appreciate your time. Nice to be with you. Good luck with the new podcast. I think it's going to be great. Former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, I appreciate your time. So as you can see, I think Joyce feels kind of the same way that we do about, about this nomination. And um, and how important it's going to be. And and again, I'm very optimistic and hopeful about um, a lot of people being held accountable. And right now, as we record this, we're on pardon watch. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's going to be interesting, too, because next week you and I are going to be having a, a friendly debate with someone who we have a difference of opinion on about the constitutional language about impeachment and pardons. Yeah. And, and and I mean, let me let me bookend that. Right. <laughs> Those of you who know me right, know that I'm coming from a place that is very progressive, um, but that n- knowing right, just like AG, <laughs> um, I police the arguments on our side that I think uh, are stronger or weaker or lack merit. And I, I have to say, I am not convinced uh, by the arguments. I, I had Professor Lawrence Tribe uh, when, when I was in law school, right? He has forgotten more about constitutional law than I will ever know. Um, there's, there's no doubt, right? Like when he's on the other side, I'm probably wrong. Uh, but his arguments as to why Trump can't pardon himself are 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 not good and are not persuasive to me. Um, and and I, I, look, I don't want to be of the mindset that Trump can pardon himself. Um, but I think like that's what the Constitution says and demands. And I, I don't think mm. we're doing ourselves any favors to try and say yeah. it shouldn't apply to, to Trump because, you know, he's a horrible Nazi garbage monster game show host. <laughs> like that's all true. But the Constitution doesn't have that exception in it. So, mm. no, the Constitution doesn't have any exceptions. But that's <laughs> where we just dis- that's where we diverge a little bit. I don't think that the president can pardon himself if there's any. Uh, limit on the pardon that could be litigated and has a chance of winning. Uh, I think that that that's it. Um, I think any other limitations, including congressional limitations, which was nixed by U.S. v. Klein, or uh, any other uh, sort of limitations on the pardon, like uh, if 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 a president's being impeached, he can't pardon people, or if he is impeached, he can't. I don't. I don't. I'm not with any of those arguments, but I think if there is one that could win, it's the self-pardon. Uh, and, and that's because of separation of powers. Right. It's supposed to be a check on the on, on the judicial branch, not on the executive branch. And I think that's like dividing by zero or something. I, <laughs> I, I would have to write the argument up to for it to, to be cogent. But that's sort of my th- those are my feelings on it. But well, I, th- I think, th- again, I mean, it's why I led off with saying on the other side is is Lawrence Tribe, right? Like that that's that's not saying on the other side is, you know, Alex Jones and the guy, you know, the <laughs> dressed in the goat horns, right? Like it's 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 Buffalo. They were <laughs> Buffalo horns, Andrew. Come on. I all I can think of is the uh the theme song from the uh nineteen eighty five dragnet with uh uh with Tom Hanks and um Oh yeah, yeah we just like hey, to dance Strebeck. Yeah. Strebeck, yeah. put on your goat leggings yeah. and try to blend in. <laughs> we, yeah, we just like to dance in our goatskin pants around this ancient. Um, 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 <laughs> yeah, people against goodness, goodness and, and normalcy. normalcy. P a g a n, pagan. Uh, nice work, Joe. Yeah. yeah, what a great movie. Uh, so we have a few things that we're going to discuss today. Let's give a little preview uh, before we take a break. Um, what 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 stories did did you want to uh, touch on today that I think are very you know prescient and relevant right now? Yeah. So there, there are two that really came to mind. The, the first is the reports coming out as to how the Senate will be structured, right? We've got a 50-50 Senate, and that creates a yes on full floor votes, right? We know that Kamala Harris can is empowered uh, to break ties. But how are committees going to be structured, right? Um, how 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 is the day-to-day business going to operate on the Senate? Um, I, I wanted to talk about that a little bit and also clear up 
I can't, some really terrible takes from you know uh, the 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 far left of our side, which again. I, it's hard to find somebody more progressive than me, but you know, you already had some some of the noisiest folks that we don't need to amplify their their particular names. You know who we're talking about uh, out there saying this proves that Biden is already capitulating, and no, it proves that you can't do math, Kyle. But um, uh, and, and so I wanted to talk about that a little bit, and then um, I I wanted to share something really really interesting that I am trying to dig down and figure out, and that is it it is an undeniable fact that. A, a, a large number of these um, uh, insurrectionist cases are being initially charged as misdemeanors, right? And I've been trying to figure out why I've got some interesting insights, maybe some super space beans, but uh, I think it's worth talking about. So uh, so we're going to get to those stories. And uh, and I know you've got something in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about all of it. Uh, I'll put a pin in it uh, to borrow your <laughs> phrase since you since you took my super space beans there. But uh, yeah, let's let's. Let's get into it right after this quick break. Thank you so much. I'm so glad everyone's here and everyone's listening. I'm so excited about this show. We're going to get into those details. Just stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. It's AG, and today's episode of Clean Up on Aisle 45 is brought to you by BetterHelp. They provide professional counseling to help you navigate life's challenges. We all face difficulties and stresses, especially now, but the important thing to remember is you don't have to do it alone. So if you're struggling with anything that's preventing you from living your best life, I recommend BetterHelp. It is not a crisis line, and it's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. They'll assess your needs, and they'll match you with a licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating in less than 24 hours. As you know, I've had struggles dealing with PTS and anxiety, and I know how important it is to seek help rather than to try to do everything by yourself. And BetterHelp services are available for clients worldwide, and they have a broad range of experts in their counselor network, a lot of which might not be locally physically available in your area. And the best thing about BetterHelp is you can log into your account from anywhere, anytime, and send a message to your counselor, and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video and phone sessions, too. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change your counselor if you want to, which is really important. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So visit their website, read some testimonials like BetterHelp user TA who says, Dr. Healy is compassionate and present as a counselor. She listens without judgment and creates a safe space for sharing. I feel heard and understood by her. So visit BetterHelp.com slash aisle 45. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. And you can join the over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer. For uh, aisle 45 listeners, you get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash aisle45. All right, everybody, welcome back to Clean Up on Aisle 45. It is me, AG, with Andrew Torres, uh, and we're about to kick off this discussion today. What do you got for us, Andrew? Yeah, so, so here's the thing. I understand that there is a very large contingent of of us in the Democratic Party that are a little bit skeptical of Joe Biden, right? Maybe he wasn't our first, third, or seventh choice in the primary. Um, he clearly ran in the conservative institutionalist lane, and and I get it. And this show will one hundred percent hold him accountable when he starts to go wobbly, right? To steal a phrase from Justin Walker, who's now on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Um, sorry, that's a, that's an inside baseball reference for those of you who've, who've been with us for a long time. Um, absolutely, it is worth calling out. It is worth pointing out that virtually all of the public announcements that Joe Biden has made, uh, particularly those since uh, Ossoff and Warnock won their races in Georgia, uh, have come from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, right? Just a couple of days ago, uh, Biden announced that the new chair of the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission is going to be Gary Gensler, um, who was described by Barney Frank and Liz Warren as the toughest regulator in the Obama administration, right? So, you know, I, it that's not a, that's not a terrible sign. 
So, uh, I was a little... Yeah, but what's but I think what's been going on here is that there's been some reporting. <laughs> uh, and they're, and it's like they're showing a photo of Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell hugging and, and, and shaking hands. And, and it says, you know, uh, there's a coalition forming or something about how they're doing a Senate leadership deal or, or some sort of thing. And I know a lot of people were kind of upset by that, like F Mitch McConnell... Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we're going to we'll talk about this, but we have to sort of put in the mix that today Mitch McConnell went on the floor of the Senate and blamed Trump for the insurrection, for inciting the insurrection. And that, I think, is going to cleave the Republican Party into Trump Republicans and OG Republicans, I guess. And uh, so it's going to be interesting to see which way it goes. But I honestly, personally, I don't see there being any kind of a a concession here by Joe Biden to Mitch McConnell. Yeah, no, that's right. So let's unpack all of that. Number one, F Mitch McConnell, right? Like, I mean, like that, you know, (laughs) there's no, there was no love for him in this room. Right. Um, And, and, and two, yes, like Mitch McConnell reading the political tea leaves. If you ask me, what do I think the odds are that the Senate will vote to convict Trump uh, on the article of incitement of resurrection, of resurrection, instead of insurrection, uh, it, it goes up every day and went up drastically today with what McConnell said. Now, is there still room for McConnell for Boom McConnell about? Of course there is. He's Mitch McConnell. He's an evil turtle. We know this. OK, so. Just because you acknowledge that 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 Mitch McConnell exists does not make you, you know, a quizling. Right. It it does not mean that you're Neville Chamberlain. Let me explain the 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 deal. The reason you have to come up with a set of rules uh, when the Senate is split 50 50 has to do with the number of Democrats that you have. Right. So there are a certain fixed number of Senate committees. You have to assign Democrats and Republicans to those committees. When Democrats outnumber Republicans or vice versa, then Democrats outnumber Republicans on all the committees. Right. And that you can do that because math. Right. But when you only have 50 Democrats to go around, you can either have a situation where eh, we just punt on a couple of committees. There are a few we don't care about and we let Republicans have the majority or Every committee will wind up being split evenly between Democrats and Republicans, right? Which, but the chair, the chair, the is, chairs will be is the difference. Yeah, and so the chairs get to set the agenda, and then the only other real question. There's going to be lots of other stuff, and I read this because I'm a total geek who reads Senate procedure stuff. The only thing that matters is what happens, as will be the case, when there's a tie. Right. And the last time that the Senate was divided 50 50, right, was heading into 2001. Right. And in that situation, and, then, and that was unfortunately uh, George W. Bush. Um, and, and in that situation, right, it, it, the same rules that we're talking about were engineered in reverse. And critically, when it was tied, it meant that either the majority leader or the minority leader in that committee could advance legislation out onto the floor, right? It would clear committee and would then go to the majority leader, who is going to be Chuck Schumer, there's no doubt about that, right, uh, to, to put on the calendar. So the only possible McConnellization victory would be if a tie counted as nothing, right? Like when when the Supreme Court was split 4-4 and a tie meant, okay, well, the lower court decision stands and we're doing nothing about it, right? That would be a disaster. That was the first thing I looked for before I went to go chastise everybody. But um, no no particular deal has been struck yet. Um, but, but the folks saying, I don't understand why we have to strike a deal at all. Well, the reason you have to strike a deal at all is math. Mm-hmm. Um, you just it have has to, to you, do with the fact that, that, that there will be and the vice president cannot break ties on Senate committee votes. And there is reasonable precedent. OK, in the absence of a special deal to the contrary, that, that that's why I went to that to say a tie vote means not advancing out of committee. Right. If you look at standing rules right now, when there are uh, odd numbers on the committee, it, it says you must have a majority of the votes 
right? It, uh, under particular conditions, right? Now, are those are those the rules as they exist? Can those rules be changed? So to say that to say that if to say if there is a tie, the tie goes to the runner, for example. Uh, like if there is a tie, it advances. Yes, and that's and. That's part of what the deal would encompass. I got gotcha. So, yes, those are standing rules. Yes, that's this is why you have to cut a deal with Mitch McConnell. Um, and there is a package, the package that was in place last time in Congress, uh, <laughs> cut with then Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott. So, you know, just when you think like uh, we never really, you know, go up or down in terms of Republican Majority Leaders, like, whew, um, <laughs> uh, Trent Trent Lott, no prize pig, less le- less smart, just as evil as Mitch McConnell. So, <laughs> um, so I I have a, a another question too because I guess sort of what I'm wondering is like first of all I'm, I'm interested to know what committees were sacrificed in 2000 because yeah, there seems like there's going to be some like yeah we get intelligence judiciary uh finance and homeland security you get uh grounds and uh envir- you know you get uh, gardening and you know like <laughs> it's not going to be like that simple right it can't be like well we're the democrats we've got the white house so we're going to say we get to keep the committees we want and we'll give up on these committees but i mean mcconnell could just say no yeah, the, the, that's right. I mean, and 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 the first part I think is is the most instructive part of what you said, which is right. The Republicans are the party of oh yeah, well, we don't care if we don't have anybody on the education committee or not, right? Like, but Democrats can't really take that approach. So I it everything I've I've seen you know makes it appear as though we're going to replicate the two thousand and one uh, deal, which makes total sense right it is the outcome that you reach when you look at it and go okay well everything else is worse Mm -hmm. and i assume there will be an outcry uh, when some committees are um conceded to the other side well no i don't so so i don't anticipate that we will wind up conceding any committees right but i think what, what will happen is we will have evenly split democrats and republicans on every committee including the chair and vice chair um or chair and ranking member so so it will be part of the deal is that the all of the uh, Democrats will be the ranking members will be that will be the chairs. Yeah, right. Right. But but it's like eight Democrats, eight Republicans and then a Democrat chair and a Republican ranking. Yes, so exactly. Nine right. and nine. Exactly. Right? right. Exactly. Right. Well, I think that'll be interesting. But yeah, today, this 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 floor speech by McConnell today just blew <laughs> everything up, didn't it? I mean, because I was per, first of all, I was, we're still on pardon watch. I haven't gotten anything. Yeah, me neither. I'm still watching. <laughs> but I was very concerned that um, that Trump would keep some pardons secret or uh, or that maybe he wasn't going to pardon himself or his family members or, or any insurrectionists because it would you know, put a nail in the coffin of impeachment conviction, which could then lead to a vote of him never being able to run for office again. And let's be honest, that's the only way he can make money from from here on out. Um, and so but with this new announcement from McConnell saying, you know, no, uh, he incited the mob. And uh, it's just it, I my mind was blown, honestly. No, no love to he, Mitch. He and others. Let's 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 make sure we're we're hitting the the. Uh, the McConnell clarification, right? Because he said her and others, right? Yeah, but I think he meant uh, Rudy Giuliani and... Uh, but, yeah. but might he have meant, you know, Alex Jones and what have you? It, it, if Still, I'm, it opened the door. It opened the door to a conviction. Uh, uh, zero Wider argument. than it was already... Yeah, yeah than it was yeah. already opened. Uh, mm-hmm. why, why, absolutely stepped through the door, made that, uh, in my view, a plausible outcome. If... You wanted an argument for how McConnell could walk it back, right, would be to say, well, there was this general hysteria that was whipped up by QAnon and Alex Jones and OAN and the president is just an innocent dupe in all of that. And yes, he participated in it, but it's not fair to say he masterminded the whole thing. That would be if I'm if I'm channeling my inner Mitch McConnell, which God, I never expected to utter that phrase in 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 public. Uh, that's that's the way I would put that's, it. That's gross. First of all, yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> in, in, inner Mitch McConnell. Um, so, I, I, well, 
you know, here we are. And it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens. The impeachment trial isn't going to be starting until after Trump is out of office, uh, which is legal. So everyone who is that using that as a defense on the side of the Republicans can shut it. Uh, but that will be their defense. Um, it's it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to watch. I for for our lot awful movies, we went back and watched the first episode of Rudy Giuliani's podcast. I don't know if you have seen this. <laughs> No, okay. why would you do that to yourself I, after after having an internal Mitch McConnell? Yeah, no, you go we, and watch we, you Rudy know, Giuliani. As as our, as patrons of this show will come to realize, like I <laughs> I'm willing to debase myself for small amounts of money. It's a it's a <laughs> it's a character flaw. Um, and uh, Rudy Giuliani's argument was, and I am this is as close to word for word as you can get without the transcript. The president could only be impeached for four things: bribery treason high crimes or misdemeanors right and then these you know these two these two articles of impeachment didn't count because neither were you know official crimes and so i'm just sitting there and I literally like i just laughed for an hour and a half going like oh you know if trump had unpaid parking tickets it would be totally valid um <laughs> right. but misdemeanors sure uh, but we're gonna hear we are going to hear this argument jonathan turley has already made this argument of if it's not a crime right in chapter 18 of the u.s code you can't impeach for it and that that's just like i i used to come up with the hypotheticals right like i used to say like well what if the president you know d decided to just go off and live in the himalayas or whatever but like you can't come up with a hypothetical worse than what trump did right like no which is yeah, it is the hypothetical <laughs> yeah. like we, we, yeah what if the president is very obviously a traitor <laughs> and encouraged an armed mob of insurrectionists to storm the Capitol um, doesn't quite seem to be a law that prevents that. Uh, but you probably would want him out. And, and, and it is going to be hilarious to watch all of the Republicans who lined up and uh, and, and, and parroted this message because because you, you may have forgotten. But like the this isn't a crime Right. This isn't the precise elements of bribery. Uh, and so therefore it doesn't count um, that there were 30 or 40 Republicans in the. Oh, well, you know, if it's not 18 USC 1001, then, you know, go fuck yourself. Um, and they're going to have to walk that back. Yeah. I remember the Wisconsin guy saying, where do we get the cross examinations? They, I mean, they're all they were treating this like it was a criminal procedure yeah. and an impeachment is not a it's a political process it's not a criminal procedure and it was yeah that was extremely frustrating and they'll they'll drag it all out again it'll be uh, although i don't know who his lawyers are going to be rudy giuliani has now said he will <laughs> not be representing the president because he is a witness and he should have said subject of the investigation yeah. <laughs> yeah. um uh, uh so he says he's not going to be representing him although i think it's because trump won't pay him um and then i mean what that leaves what Lynn Wood maybe? Uh, Sydney Powell is is bowing out today uh, from her last election Kraken thing uh, lawsuit, and and so that just leaves Captain Underpants Alan Dershowitz. Um, they they specifically asked you omitted, but they specifically asked uh, Jenna Ellis. You know the like twenty seven year old dipshit, right? Yeah. Uh, who I you know la last worked uh, as a, a you know traffic court lawyer. Yeah. yeah. And and she said no, she would not be handling the uh, the impeachment defense. Which I I I I begging you, Jenna, please reconsider. Mm, like, yeah. I, there's nothing that would make me happier than watching her lead the president's defense team. Um, I know. I was sort of hoping to watch Rudy Giuliani question Rudy Giuliani in the proceedings. Um, but I guess that I guess we're not going to. Wasn't there wasn't there an episode of Benson like that where? He... <laughs> Oh, wow man. deep cut deep I'm, cut I'm, andrew i'm going we already did uh you know the the uh the old uh friday remake so <laughs> yep all right well we're gonna take another quick break we'll be right back um everybody stick around 
Hey everybody, it's AG from Cleaning Up on Aisle 45, and I'm here with Andrew Torres, and we want to tell you about this new app called Stereo, which is a free app you can download and listen in to conversations live and submit questions as they happen. So it's like a, a new uh, social platform for live broadcasting. Yeah, AG and I did uh, four different uh, interviews leading up to the launch of this show on Stereo. You get your own little emoji when you're on. It's super cute. Uh, but, but really, Really, it, it, what makes the platform is it's, it is designed to maximize interactivity. So if you are listening, you record a question, it pops up instantly on our screen or on our moderator screen, and we can just click the button and say, go ahead and play the question. And so you get interactive Q&A, your voice talking to us, our voice responding to you, in a way that's moderated that, you know, you, you couldn't otherwise do with 800 people shouting out loud <laughs> as they listen. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. We're going to continue to do it. Yeah. So, so check us out every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern on the Stereo app. Download the app. It's free to download. And, uh, and we're going to play some clips of us from the Stereo app after the end of this particular podcast. So stick around after the end of this podcast to listen for some clips from Stereo and tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. on the Stereo app to listen to us. Thanks so much. Okay, AJ, um, you may have seen what I have seen, which is that uh, while a lot of indictments have come down against folks who've been involved in the January 6th insurrection, a lot of the charges seem pretty thin, right? They are charges of, uh, you know, uh, unlawful entry and uh, violent entry and dis disorderly conduct on the Capitol grounds. Um, the, 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 the case that dropped today that, that most got me searching was um, U.S. versus Emmanuel Jackson. Um, and this is the person uh, who is alleged, uh, and I say alleged, there are eight different photos in the indictment. So, you know, it is what it is uh, of swinging a baseball bat, right? You've seen this where the uh, police officers are uh, armed with the Lexan riot shields um, and he's got a full bat and he's hacking away uh, in the in the middle of this crowd. Um, and. So I started asking my friends, uh, why is this person being charged with a bunch of misdemeanors um, as opposed to really, really serious, you know, felony assault crimes? Right. Right. So far, I think everyone's just been charged with the baseline misdemeanors of violent entry into a public space they were where they weren't supposed to be kind of like a trespassing but on federal uh which is because it's different because it's federal and so just a couple like two or three everyone's just sort of being brought up on these two or three charges yep. and and those are right at, as you alluded right 18 usc 1512 that is obstruction of an official proceeding uh 18 usc 1752 which is unlawful entry and physical violence on a restricted building or grounds and then a handful and 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 Jackson falls under this, is also charged with 18 U.S.C. 111, which is assaulting an officer of the United States. Um, I, that sounds serious. But remember, uh, assault is just uh, the the unwarranted apprehension of, of someone. Right. So like a lot of things fall under assault when you actually physically touch someone that is battery. Right. Um, so I got two different um, answers back to this question. And, and both I thought were super interesting, right? Um, I'm going to give you the less interesting, uh, but, but almost certainly more correct one first. Um, and, and that is, uh, the, the idea is, uh, to bring these folks under the ambit of DOJ as quickly as possible. Um, that, uh, that way, they are going to they will be under uh, DOJ supervision. Right. The U.S. attorney's office will will know where they are. Um, they will be subject to certain pretrial conditions. Right. So even when you're indicted on a misdemeanor, you can say, OK, you'll be released on your own recognizance, but you can't travel out of state. Right. Uh, you have to surrender your firearms. Right. So so basically gets them into the system um, and then. Uh, you can file superseding indictments, right? 
Um, and 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 I think the firearm is probably a uh, a, a, a real motivator here. Um, but then I got a more interesting answer. Again, not sure it's a more correct. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, because I wanted, you know, I wanted to say that, you know, we watched the press conference finally when the FBI uh, deputy director of the Washington field office, (laughs) oddly, uh, came out and uh, from the Department of Justice, Michael Sherwin, the D.C. U.S. attorney, uh, came out. And that was one of the uh, things that one of the myths he wanted to dispel. He was like, look, we're not just going to charge these guys with trespassing and let them go. We're doing this to charge them, to get them, to arrest them, to put them on the radar. And we'll continue an investigation into these folks for additional crimes. Yep. Right. I mean, he, he he sort of tried to dispel that myth, but he didn't he didn't go into any more specifics about crimes that could be charged or would be charged, uh, although he did mention, you know, sedition, conspiracy. Um, uh, it, but he didn't he didn't have any other specifics besides that. And Michael Sherwin, by the way, jerk, uh, <laughs> terrible, awful, horrible. He's he's been the, the D.C. U.S. attorney that was worked really hard to undo the what was it, Flynn or Stone or both um, uh, sentencing. Right. Uh not on Flynn, but yeah, I, I I certainly agree with you. Not our friend. Uh, so yeah, so he he was the one who who submitted on behalf of Department of Justice to the courts about Stone's sentencing, about reducing uh, the Stone sentence. He's old, you know. <laughs> he's he's come on. Would you put a sixty six year old guy in the? Pr- yeah, if he threatened to kill a witness and kill the witness's dog. Yeah, probably. Um, but anyway, yeah. So that's Sherwin. So. Uh, going back to the second answer that you got, though, I'm very interested because, like I said, Sherwin didn't go into any detail. Yeah. And 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 just to to pile on that a little bit, Sherwin was handpicked by Bill Barr for those cases. So when we say no friend of ours, we mean no friend of ours. Um, here's an additional thought. And um, and, and two separate people uh, raised this issue to me. Um, including uh, one one person who did it in public in kind of a brief way, uh, Tim Hogan, and then um, and then somebody else who wanted to, to to stay anonymous, and it has to do with how criminal cases are processed in federal court, and so what happens is when you file a case, um, it immediately gets a caption, and and you've seen this right, like the caption is how I get to on Pacer and find all of the pleadings that I then read and send to you. Right. And so it will have, right. A little number and then a colon. Right. So, um, let's, let's talk about, uh, let's use Jackson's, uh, as an example here. His is case number one, colon 21. That means it was filed in 2021 dash MJ. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Dash zero zero one one five. That means it's case number one hundred and fifteen. Dash RMM. That means it's assigned to Judge Robin M. Merriweather, and Judge Robin M. Merriweather is a magistrate judge on the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. And what that means is that's not uh, somebody who has been appointed by the president for life. That's somebody who has been po- appointed by the court as a, a helper judge. Right. For a particular term. Right. And that is not to disparage the job of magistrate judges. I have friends who are magistrate judges. Uh, Many, many magistrate judges have gone on to become appointed to the bench Um, in in Maryland, where I practice. uh, We had a longstanding magistrate judge who was probably like the most respected jurist in the state of Maryland. Right. So that there's that that's not to say that there's anything that they're not like JV judges. Right. Um, but that's what that little MJ means in the caption. Ordinarily, if it's a, if it's a civil case, that's a CV. If it's a criminal case, it gets a CR. If it gets assigned directly to the magistrate judge, which is what happens when you were charged with a federal misdemeanor, then it bypasses the criminal docket altogether. And so the thought process was people are putting together lists Right. We're on pardon watch right now. We're at, you know, T minus about 14 hours. You're part of you're putting together a list of uh, bad guys and villains for Donald Trump to pardon. uh, And you want to pull from the criminal docket. You're you're probably not pulling from the 
uh, magistrate judge docket, right? Um, it's a it's a different search. You might not see it. Almost all of those cases, there's like I I don't even know uh, if you can pardon a DC misdemeanor. I tried to research this, and the only thing I can come up with is somebody tried to pardon one like thirty years ago. <laughs> um, it never ever happens, right? The reason why well, supposedly it's the president. Supposedly it's the president who has the power to pardon DC misdemeanors because. Uh, that th- because there is no governor, right? DC doesn't have statehood, B- right? Because because DC is not a state, and the Home Rule Act of 1973 says that the president gets yeah. the pardon for crimes. And why 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 would this matter anyway? When the president can just issue a blanket pardon for insurrectionists without names or crimes, he he certainly could. But I think that goes back to your view of the politics and the dynamics in light of McConnell's statement today, right? To do that. And, 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 and let's be very, very clear. He could follow the Jimmy Carter example of blanket pardon to all draft dodgers in Vietnam. Right. Um, but then the president would have to write a piece of paper that says to anyone who was involved in the events in the, in the in at the Capitol building in Washington D.C. on January sixth, twenty twenty one, are hereby and forever uh, pardoned in full for any and all crimes committed then in being at the time. Like that seems an awful lot like an admission of guilt by the president that he incited the insurrection. Right, but he doesn't even have to release that piece of paper to the public, according to Margaret Love, pardon attorney, uh, from the Department of Justice, which Trump ignores anyway. But uh, he could just write down a pardon for Trump Jr. and hand it to Trump Jr. and not tell anybody about it, right? So so here's the thing. It, it, there's been a lot of talk about the sort of secret pardons um, and 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 I'm in general agreement, right, that there is no affirmative obligation to broadcast your pardon, um, although, you know, you, you would still have to record it with the National Archives, right? It's still a presidential record, right? So it, it th- somebody th- would leak that shit, though. Yeah, right? Not only would somebody <laughs> leak that shit, but the reason that it works in the context of Donald Trump Jr. is the way in which pardons operate, right? Which is, um, think about how Michael Flynn, right, it, it acted on his pardon. He had Sidney Powell attach it to a motion to dismiss, right? You say, oh, look, here, I got the magic paper. And the judge looks at it and goes, yeah, you got the magic paper. You're out of here, right? So you could understand if the pardon names an individual, how you, it could be a, you know, pocket pardon or secret pardon, because that individual would at least know and be able to present it. Right. So Buffalo Horns guy wouldn't know there's a secret yeah. written down pardon uh, for him. Um, and and of course, Trump wouldn't have the list of names uh, of people. Uh, right. So. So yeah. if so he's, get, unless he's just going to on social shaman, media, he's got to say in public, yep, all those crazy idiots that I've tried to tell you are really secret Antifa double dog dare undercover protesters paid by George Soros. I am pardoning each and every one of them. Um, and, and right to at least get the word out to them to the, so that they yeah. know that they've been pardoned so that the, when they're indicted. Because otherwise it's no good. Right. Right. If, if, and, and, and that's a really important thing to like the pardon isn't magic, right? It, you have to, this is, and you and I broke down the question of like what it means to accept and, and, uh, uh, accept guilt for it. But, but, but in practical terms, what it means is you have to take the piece of paper to a judge. You have to know. Yeah. You have to know that you've been pardoned. Yeah. Uh, so so he could write down Don Jr. is pardoned for anything and all things that, that I've ever done ever. And we'll rip off the paper and hand it to Don Jr. And he, they, no one announces it until we indict Don Jr. Uh, and then he'll come out to court and say, I've got my piece of paper. I've got my, you know, I've got my note from my mom. Uh, that says you can't, uh, that, and then we'll learn. That's when you learn, right, is in, in the court proceeding. Uh, however, as we know, I don't know that the first indictments against Don Jr. would be federal. <laughs> I think they will be coming from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in New York. I think you're right on that one. I certainly wouldn't bet the under on that. <laughs> well, this has been super fascinating and i'm so excited about this show uh you can tell tell everyone where they can find us find us on twitter because we want your input we want this to be your show too we want to know what you want to hear about as long as it has to do 
with holding the Trump uh, crime syndicate accountable, what's going on in Joe Biden's Department of Justice moving forward. And I would I'm even going to be talking about the um, the intelligence community. Oh, I, I, I cannot wait to pick your brain and take advantage of your experience in those areas. I mean, it's it's really perfect. Look, like we all want to know. How do we rebuild America right now? And um, and 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 I want to echo what you've just said, which is we are doing our best. It's, it's it's hard to make a podcast a, a a conversation. We we are we are doing our best to do that. So um, where can you find us on social media? Uh, at aisle forty five pod on Twitter. Um, there is a new Facebook group. It's a uh, it's a closed group because that's the way those things work. Um, but it is aisle forty five on Twitter. Um, just just search for it, and uh, and you, you have to answer like two basic questions to be allowed in. And if you want these episodes ad free, oh. and if you want any other kind of perks, we we have so many gifts that we will shower upon thee uh, if you become a patron. And can you tell them where they can find us on Patreon? Yeah, so head on over Patreon p a t r e o n dot com slash aisle forty five pod a i s l e four five p o d. Um, sign up. Throw us a buck, right? It's just, and by the way, if you're on the old Mueller she wrote system, um, this is not this is this is per episode, right? We do we do one a week, right? So you you know what you're getting. You can cap it if you really want to play us for suckers. You could seriously do this. I'm going to tell you how to cheat the system right now. Um, you go in, you sign up a dollar per episode and then you click on the little thing that says cap my monthly episodes at one right so there you go you're literally giving us one american dollar you cheapskate um but but you will get (laughs) access to everything in that dollar tier um i i want to shout out uh our can i shout out our top six yeah let's do it awesome so our top six right now are chris simpson charles jones jameel chohan Jessica Oudbeer, Jay Baker, and Patty B. Thank you so much for supporting us again. Everybody else, you you will not regret this. Uh, head on over patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod. Throw us a buck and you'll get all the goodies. Yep. And everybody, we will see you next Wednesday. And then, of course, live on the Stereo app every Tuesday. And stick around at the end of the credits of this episode. And you can hear a little clip from that Stereo app as well. So you can kind of get the gist of it. So thank you so much. I have been A.G. And I'm Andrew. And this is Clean Up on Aisle 45. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written and executive produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres and is engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Audio. Fact-checking and research by Allison and Andrew with quality assurance and media by Muller She Wrote LLC. Branding design and logo by Starburns Audio and Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. And our copy is written by Jesse Egan. Follow us on Twitter at Aisle 45 Pod and listen wherever you get your podcasts. My question is, what do we do if the worst happens and the inauguration is disrupted and it turns out that, you know, the institutions of government uh, do get broken down? What are our next steps uh, in a worst case scenario? Thanks. Andrew, you want to take this one? uh, Sure. If something, if, if bad things happen... On like, yeah, let's Wednesday. say an attack is let's say an attack is successful on inauguration. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 if that happens, it it will be a a a, a tragedy, um, and uh, it it may supplant, uh, you know what 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 is if you can imagine it. Uh, just six days ago, right, the the first uh, insurrection on American soil in two hundred years. Um, but it will not fundamentally change the structure of of our government any more so than the fact that you know these yahoos managed to storm the capitol and and you know and, and take the counterfactual there season 4 of how we win is here for the past 4 years we've been making history in critical elections all over the country And last year, we made history again by expanding our majority in the Senate, beating election-denying Republicans in crucial state house races, and fighting back a non-existent red wave. But the MAGA Republicans who plotted and pardoned the attempted overthrow of our government now control the House, thanks to gerrymandered maps and repressive anti-voter laws. 
and the chaotic spectacle we've already seen shows us just how far they will go to seize power, dismantle our government, and take away our freedoms. So the official podcast of The Persistence is back with season four. There's so much more important work ahead of us to fight for equity, justice, and our very democracy itself. We'll take you behind the lines and inside the rooms where it happens with strategy and inspiration from progressive changemakers all over the country. And we'll dig deep into the weekly news that matters most and what you can do about it with messaging and communications expert, co-founder of Way to Win, and our new co-host, Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. So join Steve and I every Wednesday for your weekly dose of inspiration, action, and hope. I'm Steve Pearson. And I'm Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. And And this this is is How We Win. Win.